Thank you for listening to the Tortoise and the Hare Financial Podcast. My name is Jim Leo. I am partner at TVH Group, president of TVH Financial, and private wealth advisor at Wayne Tree Financial Solutions. In this episode, we're going to go through an article written in the Toronto Star called 30 Days to a More Financially Secure Future. But before we get started, let's hear a word from my sponsor. Well, let's get started with today's podcast. As mentioned, I'm going to go through an article that was written in the Toronto Star by Leslie Ann Scorgi. And uh, this was in the Star on Monday, the October the 19th, 2020. I've also included the link to the article in the podcast description for you to go through in detail if you like. And again, it's titled 30 Days to a More Financially Secure Future. It's possible here's how. I'm going to start with reading um, just a small little bit uh, in the introduction of the article itself. Financially organized people save more money, have less debt, and lower stress. Even through the financial uncertainty of 2020, these folks have their house in order, following best practices to simplify their accounts, aligning with their partner on money mindset, protecting their household from financial losses, and growing savings for their family's future. If a financially strong household is what you want, there are a number of things you can do in the next 30 days to improve your cash flow and net worth. So let's go through some of the steps that um, Leslie Ann goes through here. And the first one is to get clear about where you stand financially and then streamline. This is one area that I find uh, in my experience with working with clients is they lack understanding, not so much of the assets and investments that they might have, but really where their money is going to from a cash flow perspective. I mean, it's easy to to identify or know that you're making this big mortgage payment at the end of each month or this big rent payment at the end of each month and even have an idea of, um, you know, what your taxes might be. Um, but most people don't tend to look at the little expenditures. And in my uh, previous podcast, um, Seven Ways You Lose Money Every Single Day, I did um, provide some examples of how people are spending and losing money on things that they, you know, pre-authorized payments that they just kind of forget about. Gym memberships is a perfect example. Um, ATM fees, um, bank account fees. So those are things that we could do um, to identify areas where um, we are losing money and we need to streamline. Another example of an area where we can streamline is in the type of accounts or the amount of accounts that we, uh, that we hold. I have sat down with clients who have come to me and have multiple, multiple investment accounts, um, lending facilities. It's just, uh, you know, even bank accounts. I've seen people with 10, 15 different bank accounts and they use it, you know, to try to keep track of some of their expenses, but sometimes it just makes it easier to consolidate and streamline everything. So one example that um, Leslie uh, goes through here in the article is, to tally up your assets and liabilities. So this is to determine what your net worth is. And a lot of people, again, when I sit down with them and I ask them that question, what do you think your net worth is? People don't really have an understanding, A, of how to calculate that, what that really means or what that number looks like. So the easiest way to really do that is to tally up your assets and liabilities then subtract liabilities from your assets to determine your net worth. So, you know, to keep it simple, add up everything you own and subtract everything that you owe, and that is your net worth. And that's really precisely the number you'll need to know to see where you stand. It's all about the net worth. Even in talking to a lot of high net worth people, they never really talk about what they have, and they never really talk about what they owe. They always refer to their net worth. So you might have someone who might have a net worth of, let's say, $100 million. Now, what they might have is $200 million in assets. They might have $100 million in debt. When you subtract that, well, they're worth $100 million, and that's pretty impressive. So we need to really identify what the net worth is to really have an understanding of where we are from an overall wealth perspective. Um, It's also the number you'll want to focus on growing in the long term because it's what uh, will fund your 
eventual retirement. So when I go through the exercise of a retirement plan for clients, um, again, really we focus on the total net worth because at the end of the day, that's the capital that you're going to have access to for when you are set to retire. Now, we have programs in place uh, that assist uh, clients with determining that net worth. So if you need help with that, uh, let me know, reach out to me, and we can definitely put you through the process of identifying what your current net worth is. We can also help you identify what your projected net worth is based on what you're currently doing, based on current market conditions and expected return. And in many cases, um, we're able to provide alternative solutions to help increase your net worth um, for retirement. So again, if you'd like to go through uh, that that exercise, let me know and I'd be more than happy to help you with that. Now, in terms of identifying your uh, expenses, there are free tools out there. If you if you have access to Excel, maybe even Google uh, Docs and Sheets might have uh, some templates that are available. I know Excel does, where you can identify and determine um, what your cash flow expenses are. So that's one way of determining it if you don't want to work with someone like myself. Uh, another way is I have uh, I personally use it. It's mint.com. Uh, it's offered through Intuit. And it's a safe and secure program where you can actually connect your credit card accounts as well as your bank accounts uh, using your bank card to the program. And at the end of each day, um, it'll actually uh, download all the data and categorize a lot of your expenses. When you first set it up, um, it's pretty good at, at identifying about 70 to 80% of those expenses. And then the remaining 30 to 20%, you can go in there manually and identify what those expenses are for. And then it's pretty seamless in, in working with the program. There is a phone app available as well. So you, at any time you can pull up to see uh, what your expenses are and, and even uh, from a budget perspective, um, you'll be able to determine what those numbers are. Now, um, in terms of budgeting, this has been my experience with budgeting. They work very much like diets. And what I mean by that is diets fail 90% of the time, or people who run through a diet or work through a diet fail um, 90% of the time. And budgets are the same thing uh, or the same result. And the reason for it is, just like diets, you know, you feel really good about losing your weight the first month, the second month, and you start to look and feel better. And, um, you know, you've restricted yourself from a lot of the things that you enjoy. And then what tends to happen usually within the, the second or third month is because you felt so deprived, you go out maybe to a party and you'll eat a whole pizza or you'll eat, you know, half a cake or whatever it might be. And then you feel guilty and you fall off the wagon and you don't go back on track again. Budgets tend to be uh, or tend to react the same way for a lot of people where you might feel good about you know, depriving yourself of whatever the expense might be. And you might feel really good about collecting all those coins in the jar at the end of the month and how much you've saved. But with a lot of people who budget, usually within the second or third month, um, they feel so deprived, they'll go out there and they're below their budget by buying a big, huge, call it TV or a boat or an expensive trip, whatever it might be. So, um, what I have found where people are more successful is in just tracking your expense, just like tracking your calories, just being aware of where your money is going. And most people tend to make adjustments once they are aware of those examples. Uh, I'll use me as an example. I've, I've shared this uh, in my previous episode where, you know, there was a time where every single day I would go out and get myself a, a large double-double and a newspaper. And, you know, mentally, in my mind, it was pocket change, you know, or change that I found in my console in my car. But one day I sat down and I actually calculated what that meant over the year. And it was about $700 that I was spending on a double-double and a newspaper. Now, it doesn't mean that I should stop, you know, drinking double doubles or stop buying the newspaper, um, but I did want to make some adjustments. And once I recognized that, 
I stopped buying those newspapers, uh, bought myself a tablet at the time, and started to reading. Uh, started to read my news off of the uh, the tablet or web browsers. And I don't drink as many double doubles as I used to. Um, you know, I, I make more coffee at home now, which is a lot more cost effective. But I still have my one double double a day. So that was just an example of where. You know, mentally it was just pocket change, but when you add it all up, it was a lot of money. And seven hundred dollars a year, once you multiply that, you know, times X amount of years, five or ten, and then if you actually add a rate of return that I could have earned on that money had I saved it and invested it, it's a large sum of money over a long period of time. So again, you know, do I, do I think you should uh, stick to a budget? If you can, great. If you're someone that's disciplined that way, wonderful, do it. But if you're someone that doesn't really like to follow budgets or would struggle with it, like diets, just go ahead and, and maybe go through the exercise for a month or two and identify where your money goes. Um, you'll be amazed at some of the, the expenses um, in, when you add it all up what that really looks like. And then you'll, you will make adjustments, um, based on, uh, on those findings. Um, you know, the other thing that we could do, I, I apologize for the pause is if you are a visual person, sometimes again, when you go through a planning program, um, it just spits out a bunch of numbers, but if you're someone who's visual and would prefer to look at your overall financial picture on, let's say like a game board, um, type model, we also have programs, uh, for the, for people who are visual, where we could lay everything out in one single, um, you know, game board and you can visualize things that way. And then again, you can kind of see where your money is going and we could look at making some adjustments or changes from there. So if you would like to go through that exercise, let me know. Um, the second thing that, um, Leslie points out here is to protect yourself and your family. So you'll want to build emergency savings. We've heard that many, many times uh, to cover three to six months of your essential expenses. Now, building that up for some people can take a few years to build anywhere from three to six months worth of savings. So you can try to do that. Uh, another method is if you have access to a line of credit with a zero balance. Um, that's also another way that you could protect yourself. So if you're not able to accumulate the funds, ideally that's what you'd like to do. But if you can, as long as you have access to a lower rate line of credit with a zero balance that's used only for emergency purposes, then um, you can go ahead and do that. And uh, you can get that done through the, uh, the bank as well. From a financing perspective, you know, there are programs at uh, Scotiabank, for example, that offer a step program where you're making payments down on your mortgage, but it frees up access to a line of credit on a monthly basis. So that's a, a program that you can consider as well. You might also want to look at refinancing some of your debt. Um, you know, a lot of people carry high interest credit card debt at 22%, for example. So one of the things you could do is either look at a refinance, you know, from a, if you are a homeowner and have equity in your home right now, rates are at historic lows. So you would be switching the debt from a 22% to anything potentially under two and a half, uh, maybe under 3%. That will put more money in your pocket from a cash flow perspective, and it'll save you a lot of interest costs, which right now are going to the credit card companies and or the bank. So that's one thing you could do. Something else to consider, which I have shared with my clients throughout the years is if you, again, carry a balance on a high uh, interest credit card at 22% and you have, you know, call it $20,000 on their credit card and $20,000 sitting in your savings account, which right now might be earning 0.1%, take that money from the bank account and pay off your credit card. You're going to give yourself back close to 22% in cost savings or a rate of return. So that again is another way of putting some money uh, back in your pocket. And from a protection perspective, people don't really consider this. Um, you also should have the appropriate level of life insurance, critical illness, and disability insurance. 
you should consider drawing up a will uh, in the event that a catastrophe strikes you or if you're married, your spouse. One of the biggest assets that we have, you know, when I ask clients, what's your largest asset? Most people say, oh, my house or whatever it might be, my, my investment account. The answer is your ability to earn income. That is your biggest asset. And people don't tend to protect themselves um, as an asset. So you should consider critical illness. You should consider disability insurance to protect your assets. And again, if you're married and you have a spouse who earns a significant level of income, when I go through insurance planning with a client, when I show them the number uh, in terms of the coverage that they should have, most people are shocked by that number. And the reason why they're shocked is in their mind, they're thinking, well, I just need the mortgage and the debt and some final expenses dealt with. But what they don't really consider, what's mo what most people don't consider is the, um, you know, you, you've lost that income or that family household has lost the income from the spouse that has just uh, passed away. So we need to replace that lost income. And sometimes we need to replace it for a short period of time. Sometimes we need to uh, replace it for an extended period of time. And in order to replace that lost income, you have to have a lump sum of funds that you can draw from. So that's, again, another way to protect yourself and uh, and your wealth and your family. And I'm going to use me as an example. I've used it in uh, some prior episodes where I talked about my critical illness situation. Last year, I had open heart surgery. It was very unexpected. I literally found out uh, on the one day and within five days, I was um, at St. Michael's Hospital getting open heart surgery. I really didn't know how long I was going to be out of commission. Minimum should have been six months, but they did say uh, it should have been anywhere from six to 12 months. But because of the business that I'm in, it's not a physical business. I work out of an office and I meet with clients. Um, as long as my stress level was in check, um, they said four months was my minimum. Well, I had four months where I wasn't going to earn any income. And I had critical illness insurance. And as a result, you know, I was able to recover without having to worry about my finances because I had this injection of capital that came in that I was able to uh, live off of and um, deal with my expenses, my ongoing expenses, like my mortgage and so on and so forth. It, it allowed me to recover peacefully with no stress. And it also meant that I wasn't forced to liquidate any of my holdings that were intended for my future retirement. I didn't have to refinance my house. I didn't have to sell my house. I had this injection of capital. So if that's something you've never considered, even a little uh, amount of coverage goes a long way. We can assist you um, with that if you'd like to consider some critical illness coverage. The next thing Leslie Ann talks about is to align your money mindset and behavior with your spouse. She writes, if you've never spoken about money with each other, ease your way into the conversation by speaking openly about your views on money management, where they came from and what money means to you. Most of what we've learned about money comes from our parents and their experiences. And we all come from different backgrounds with different experiences on how our family, our parents uh, manage their money. One common one that I deal with or have dealt with over the years is the pay down of the mortgage philosophy. And a lot of that, again, comes from uh, my client's parents because that's what they uh, learned to do while they were young. And they have taught their children to do the same thing. And those children are now coming to me for money management and solutions. And the one thing that I do share with them is the fact that their parents lived through different times than what we're currently living through. For example, I will use that uh, pay down the mortgage as quickly as possible philosophy. Where that came from really was primarily from the 80s, early 80s, when at the time, you know, mortgage rates were in double digits, some as high as 22%. Can you imagine having a mortgage with a 22% rate of return on it or cost of um, borrowing. And if you look at the um, real estate at the time, you know, it was growing at five to 6% annualized. 
Um, GICs, you were able to buy a GIC and get double digit earnings on a GIC, you know, 14, 16% bonds were paying. Um, even the stock markets at the time were averaging on, you know, about 7% per year. So if you were sitting on money and you had to choose between investing it in the stock market or purchasing a GIC with it or paying off your mortgage, it made absolute sense to pay down your mortgage as aggressively as possible because you can either earn 7% on your money in the markets or you can earn 14% in a GIC or you can pay down that 22% mortgage and get a lot of that money back. It made sense to pay off that mortgage. But when we look at things today, and even in the last 10, 15 years, you know, interest rates on a mortgage have been under 6%. And recently in the last 10 years, they've been really under about 3.5%. Um, even if you looked at their variable rate, it was, uh, it, it's been very, very uh, cost effective. So if you're carrying a mortgage with a 3% cost on that mortgage, but you can take your money and earn 7% in the markets and real estate specifically Toronto GTA has been averaging again at, you know, plus six plus 7% annualized return. Well now paying off that mortgage really doesn't make sense. You're going to build greater wealth by putting your money in other investable assets that are compounding at a much higher rate than the cost for your mortgage. And the other thing too, to consider is liquidity. When you aggressively pay down your mortgage, you've given all that money to the bank and it's very difficult to get it back again. If you want any of that money back, you're going to have to go through a refinance. You have to qualify for it. And um, in terms of qualifying for it, you know, usually you have to have a job to qualify for it. And it's costly to refinance on a mortgage. So if you have your money invested in something that's generating, again, more than what the cost of your mortgage is at minimum, and it's fairly liquid, you do have accessible uh, or you have access to those investments in, in an emergency situation. So align your thought process, align your philosophies. You know, many times the, the spouses do have a different approach on money. Typically you have one that is the saver and you have one that's the spender. And what I say in that situation is learn from each other, right? The, the one that's the spender, learn to save money a little bit better. You know, use your partner as someone who can help you with that. But also with the saver, learn from the one that's the spender. Uh, enjoy some of the money. We work really hard. We need to enjoy what we've uh, built, what we've worked for. Uh, my my situation with my wife is exactly that. My wife grew up in a, an environment where they needed to save money, and she's very good at saving money. And I've been more of you know someone who likes to spend money. I do take care of my, our future, um, so it's not like I blow everything we have, or I wouldn't be a very good financial advisor. Um, so I do take care of our future, and I set money aside, and I'm building our wealth. But I'm also not afraid to spend money because, and again, yet last year was a perfect example. We just really don't know when you know we're not going to be around anymore. So you need to enjoy some of that hard work that uh, you know we work really, really hard. You need to enjoy some of that. Now, um, the next thing, and this is the final point that uh, Leslie Ann made in her article, which is get saving for your whole family. It will motivate you. So one of the things you could do is start with a systematic savings plan. I do that with my kids. Um, I do it with myself personally. It's very easy to just start an investment account or a savings account and put a small amount into it, call it $25 a month, for example. With my children, what I what I started to do with them um, about a year and a half ago is we came to an agreement that whenever they receive money from birthdays or uh, money from um, you know Christmas, that they would give me half of what they received and I would invest it for them. So we've been doing that um, in terms of their... Um, you know, every month we we give them an allowance. 
half of the allowance gets invested for them and the other half they get to use and they get to spend it. Um, we've also talked about one day when they get part-time jobs. That's another thing we we're going to do is we're going to take half of their earnings and we're going to invest it and we're going to take the other half and they can spend it however they want. And it's a very small amount, but it really adds up over time. And what I do from time to time is I sit down with my kids and I say to the kids, here's the investment accounts that you each own. And this is what you've accumulated so far. When they look at it, they're like, wow, that's that's a lot of money for, for a little kid it is. Um, but then what I point out to them is this. I, I will say to them, this is the amount that we deposited. This is how much we put into the account. But look what it's worth today. It's actually worth more than what we put into it. And I remember my daughter looking at me and she's like, so dad, what you're saying is there's a way that money can make money? And I'm like, yeah. There is a way that money can make money. That's called investing. And when she saw that, it it really clicked with her. She realized that having money, and she is a saver like my my wife, so I will point that out. Um, a lot of times she'll have you know a couple hundred dollars accumulated in her wallet because she's not a big spender. But she'll look at me and say, so I don't make money with my money sitting in my wallet, but if I give it to you and invest it, I can you know, have this money grow for me. So go through that exercise with your kids. Um, just start off with a small little savings plan. I had a client years ago. She asked if I would sit down with her daughter who was a teenager at the time um, because her daughter just started a, a newspaper route and um, she wanted me to talk to her about investing and saving. Then I went through that whole process, and that's exactly what she did. She started a, started off a pre-authorized savings plan and built another or, or a nice little savings uh, account for herself. So that's very important. Um, I'm just going to read again from the article here. If you've been sitting on the fence about investing in financial advice, money coaching, financial planner, or investment advisor, the tip I can offer you is this. People make serious progress on their money uh, on their money who always have a plan. And the best plans typically cost money to build. So if you don't have a plan, if you don't have that that roadmap um, to visualize where things are at, it's going to be difficult to build wealth. So again, working with someone like myself, working with a TVH team where we have expertise in financing, where we have expertise in legal advice and accounting, investment, retirement planning, in working with us, we could put a plan in place for you uh, to help identify how you're going to build that wealth long term, how things are going to look. Um, we also work through progress reports. It's, it's great when I sit down with clients and we establish the plan. We know what the goal is and we get together, you know, at least once a year with um, a lot of the clients and we can show them the progress report. This is where we're at and either we're at goal. Sometimes we're just shy of that goal. So we just need to either up the contributions or make some, uh, some changes. But a lot of times we're ahead of goal and, and people like that. So you need to not only put the plan in place, but you have to follow that progress and, and see where you're at. Um, so again, reach out to me if you'd like some assistance with that. The final point I'm going to make here, and I touched on this, and this is, again, I'm going to read it uh, directly from the article, is getting financially organized also means balancing having a life. So while tidying up your financial household ensures your efforts, also support spending a reasonable amount of money on what brings you joy and keeps you healthy. And out of everything that Leslie Ann wrote in her article, this is my absolute favorite paragraph. Um, you know, in my experience, I generally come across, you know, the individual who says, I'm going to save every last dime and I'm not going to spend any of it. Um, I'm going to wait till I retire and then I'm going to enjoy it all at that point. And sadly, a lot of people like that will reach retirement and they'll pass away within six to 12 months and they've missed out on life because the, their goal was to enjoy it all when they finally retired and they missed out on life. But on the flip side, I've also came across people who said, you know what, I'm going to spend every dime that I have. I'm going to enjoy every minute of my life because I really don't know when the end will come. And then they reach 65 and they're in really good health and they have nothing to show for it. And they have to continue. Now they're forced to work. 
And that's not a good position to be in either. For me, it's all about balance. Let's, let's, you know, think about tomorrow and plan for tomorrow and put, you know, pieces in place to make sure that we're going to be protected and we will have the assets to draw from when we are set to retire, but also enjoy some of it today as well. Um, you know, don't go blow your brains out on things, but enjoy some of that money because, you know, to, with my example last year, I, I had a very close call at the age of 46. That could have been the end of me. Thankfully that it wasn't, but it was definitely a wake up call for me. Don't let that be a wake up call for you as well. Enjoy life, enjoy your hard work, have some fun with it, but make sure you're taking care of yourself in the future as well. If you need any help with any of these, again, I, I do encourage you to go read the article. Um, if you need any help, you'd like some guidance, some direction, you'd like to put a plan in place to see where you're at today and project out what that's going to look like and to go through a progress report to make sure that you're on track, reach out to me. Again, I can be reached at financial at tvhgroup.ca or you can call me at 647 647- 727-4668. Until next time, again, my name is Jim Leo. I hope you have a great, wonderful day. And once again, I thank you for listening to my podcast, The Tortoise and the Hare Financial. Take care.